and welcome to the 2023 John E. Plus MD Memorial Central State Circle Lecture. It's a mouthful. I'm Sarah Halter, Executive Director of the Indiana Medical History Museum, and I thank you all for being here with us today as we honor the memory of our longtime friend and colleague, uh, Dr. John E. Plus, as well as all of the Central State Circle donors who, like Dr. Plus did, give their time, talent, and treasure to further the mission of the Indiana Medical History Museum. Central State Hospital was a critically important medical institution that served thousands of patients and despite its numerous challenges, saw great strides forward in the science of, and art of healing during its 15 decades. Donors of the Central State Circle give medical history a future through generous financial contributions and they ensure that the complicated and multifaceted stories of Central State Hospital will be uh, preserved, remembered, shared, uh, and taught, providing a basis for our understanding of how we got to where we are today. These donors and all of our donors understand that the past informs the present and inspires the future, and that the history of medicine and psychiatry are more important now than they ever have been. So we're very grateful for their passionate and enthusiastic support of the museum's work. Now, I'm going to share my screen for a second and tell you a little bit about Dr. Pless. Here we go. Esteemed pathologist and teacher, Dr. John E. Pless, was the Emeritus Clyde Culbertson Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine. He was also a state and national leader in forensic pathology and performed thousands of coroner's autopsies during his long career. I also want to mention that I found out in the last couple of years that he was also on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that you should check out online. Dr. Pless gave very generously of his time, talent, and treasure to raise awareness and promote the well being of the Indiana Medical History Museum. For many, many years, he did this. And he served as president of the IMHM Board of Directors from 2009 through 20, or 2010. Excuse me. He loved to share his knowledge of, history, of the history of medicine with visitors that he brought to the museum, including for many years the entire second year class of IU School of Medicine students at the Indianapolis campus. He made a lasting impact on so many. Even now, nearly 10 years after his passing, I still hear from people all the time who, whose lives uh, were positively affected by Dr. Pless. So this annual John E. Pless MD Memorial Central State Circle Lecture is named in his honor. And this year, I feel like my slides in advance. Uh, this year, the PLUS lecture comes on the heels of another painful loss for the PLUS family, for the museum, and for all of us here. Uh, in February, we lost John's widow, Lois Joy Stevens PLUS. Um, so we are deeply saddened by her loss and honor her memory with this year's lecture as well. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Demetrius Bianci Chapman. Demetrius earned a master's degree in public health from St. Louis University and is now a PhD candidate uh, in nursing with a health policy concentration. This is at the University of New Mexico. Previously, Demetrius served as director of public health in St. Charles County, Missouri, senior director for, part for the Partnership to Advance Tribal Health in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and executive director of the New Mexico Board of Nursing. Demetrius spent a number of years as the lieutenant commander in the U.S. Public Health Services Commission Corps in Arizona and New Mexico. And Demetrius has a long history of teaching, publishing, public speaking, nursing, volunteering, and receiving awards that are too numerous to list here today. Today, Demetrius is a registered nurse here in Indiana and a valued volunteer at the Indiana Medical History Museum. Now, we've been uh, experiencing some pretty significant issues with our internet service the last couple of months. So 
just in case we decided to record this lecture, <laughs> which um, happened just a few days ago. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and play that. But we do have Demetrius here with us who uh, will be available for a Q&A live as soon as the presentation is over. Good afternoon and welcome to the Indiana Medical History Museum speaker series. My name is Dimitri Cianci Chapman, and I'm really honored to be able to share some of the history and my rich experiences in one of the lesser known uniformed services of the federal government, the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm bringing this to you from the traditional and ancestral land of the Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Miami people. My elevator speech about the Public Health Service usually involved mentioning the Surgeon General. Most people have seen the warning on a pack of cigarettes or they saw C. Everett Koop on the news talking about HIV in the 1980s. So they've heard of the Surgeon General and the Public Health Service is the Surgeon General's Corps. Um, but I'm going to start today with the stuck elevator speech and um, tell you about the Assistant Secretary for Health. Um, this rank is actually above the Surgeon General and it's the Surgeon General's boss, the Assistant Secretary for Health, which can be filled by an officer or a civilian, is responsible for the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. The position was created in the 1960s, and only twice has a person been in it for more than five years. Um, it changes more frequently than the presidential administration who appoints the position. Um, our current Assistant Secretary for Health is Admiral Rachel Levine. Um, that's her on the left, and the flag for her office is the one with the yellow um, anchor in Caduceus. Our current Surgeon General is Vivek Murthy. He's the 21st Surgeon General, and he also served as the 19th Surgeon General under President Obama. Um, the flag for his office is the one with the white caduceus and anchor and three white stars. Um, Admiral Murthy's priorities right now are COVID-19, health misinformation, health worker burnout, workplace well-being, and your mental health. But the Public Health Service began long before the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Office of Surgeon General. Um, it began in 1798 with um, President John Adams and the Fifth Congress when they enacted the Act for the Relief of Sick and Disabled Seamen. This was a 20 cents per month taxes on the wages of seamen and um, those funds were collected to provide medical care and um, hospitals for disabled seamen and to build the marine hospital system. The earliest hospitals were in Norfolk, Virginia, Boston, Massachusetts, Newport, Rhode Island, New Orleans, and Charleston, South Carolina because along with all the goods that these ships brought to each of our colonial port cities, they also brought rats and bacteria and viruses and parasites. These deadly communicable diseases and epidemics were the norm throughout the world at this point in history. Um, bubonic plague, yellow fever, um, typhus, smallpox, influenza, and measles were, were common um, infections and epidemics. Just five years before this bill was signed into law in 1793, a yellow fever outbreak in Philadelphia, which was our nation's capital at the time, completely shut down the city. The entire government evacuated um, and it killed 5,000 people, which was 10% of the population of the city at that time. In um, the 1770s and 80s, um, smallpox was devastating New Spain pueblos in what is now New Mexico and the tribes of the Pacific Northwest. 
in the 1730s, there was a flu epidemic and there was a diphtheria outbreak in New England that killed 20,000 people. Um, in the 1720s, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had a smallpox um, epidemic that infected 5,000 people. It was the first inoculation campaign in um, the New World. And uh, ironically, Benjamin Franklin was a satirical opponent of it, but most of Boston's clergy were supporters of the campaign to help get the disease under control. Um, there were other measles outbreaks and smallpox outbreaks throughout our early history, but this is with the diseases that we were living with. And this is why at the very founding of our country, um, we had our first public health law. Fast forward a few decades and um, just uh, after the Civil War, we have a system of marine hospitals that is very poorly managed and disorganized and they have protracted quarantines of um, immigrants and citizens. Um, yellow fever could result in passengers or a crew being quarantined for up to six months and smallpox and cholera, typhus, also known as ship fever, were other reasons people were being quarantined on ships um, or in the hospitals in port cities. Um, it was so dangerous for the staff that most of the marine hospitals had a line item in their budget for staff funerals. Um, in 1858, um, a local mob on Staten Island was so concerned about immigrants bringing disease into their community that they burned down their quarantine hospital. Um, uh, a Hoosier by the name of John Shaw Billings um, was appointed by the Secretary of the Treasury in 1869 to report on the hygienic conditions of the marine hospitals. So he traveled around the country and visited the 27 marine hospitals at the time. Um, and basically what he found was widespread dissatisfaction. He felt that they were underfunded. And what he wrote was um, an ingenious models of how not to do it. Um, he was uh, later the the person charged with creating the library of the Surgeon General, and um, that evolved into the National Library of Medicine. The first place where the library of the Surgeon General was housed was in the old Ford's Theater where Lincoln had been shot. Um, So the Billings Report was very well received. And in 1870, Ulysses S. Grant and the 41st Congress um, passed some legislation and overhauled the service. Um, Grant appointed John M. Woodworth, that's him with the mustache on the bottom, um, as the first supervising surgeon, that was the title. And he implemented a quite a number of changes. Um, first, he came up with the seal, um, the fouled anchor and the caduceus. Um, he implemented exams for the applicants and put them in uniforms, and he made them a mobile public health workforce. Um, all the hospitals were consolidated um, and managed centrally. And um, in 1873, the title changed to Supervising Surgeon General. In 1877, there was a yellow fever outbreak in New Orleans that made its way up the Mississippi River Valley, and that prompted Congress to create the Quarantine Act of 1878, and that moved a lot of quarantine responsibilities out of the hands of states and into federal authority. In 1887, a laboratory of hygiene on Staten Island was established, and that later evolved into the National Institutes of Health. In 1889, um, an act signed by Grover Cleveland regulated appointments to the Public Health Service, and um, uh, it, it made the system so that um, officers were appointed 
and by the president um, with the advice and consent of the Senate. And it established the US Public Health Service Commission Corps within the Marine Hospital Service and um, gave those officers military pay grades. Commodore Walter Wyman was appointed um, in 1891, and he is our longest serving Surgeon General. He served for over 20 years, which is really unheard of because um, it's a presidential appointment and it usually changes hands with a new administration. But he served um, under Hoosier President Benjamin Harrison, who appointed him, and also Cleveland, McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, and Taft. Um, a lot happened to the public health service during his tenure too. In 1893 and 1906, maritime quarantine responsibilities were expanded to Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Panama, um, and the Philippines. In 1894, the Louisiana Leper House was founded, and that later became the U.S. Public Health Service National Leprosarium, a place for permanent quarantine for um, people with Hansen's disease, or what was known then as leprosy. In 1901, a study of, he implemented a study of leprosy and established the Hawaii Leprosy Hospital. Um, that's him in white on the bottom. Um, at the grave of Father Damien in Hawaii. 1902, Congress broadened the scope to include um, prevention duties, um, human disease research, sanitation, um, water supply control, and sewage. And um, the name was changed to the Public Health and Marine Hospital Service. Um, he also created the professional journal called Public Health Reports and they be, he began convening a conference of state health authorities. Um, also in 1902, the Biologics Control Act was passed and that put regulation of biological products such as vaccine and antitoxins um, in the hands of his office. In 1900 to 1904, San Francisco was having an outbreak of plague. Um, and they tried a number of measures to try to control this outbreak, mostly cementing basements and foundations so rats couldn't get into where people lived. Um, there were a lot of rumors that um, the infection came from Chinatown, but uh, that's not really clear as to whether or not they were being scapegoated um, or if that's true, if that's truly where the um, infection came from. But Commodore Wyman tried to impose a travel embargo on anybody coming from California who did not have um, a certificate of health that they didn't have the plague. And this put him at odds with the California governor. Um, in fact, all the public health efforts to control that um, outbreak were met with resistance because people didn't want word to get out that California had plague. Um, they were afraid it would hurt business and that it would um, hurt um, the, the reputation of the state. So um, the, the matter eventually got settled um, with the um, governor and they did get the plague outbreak under control. So moving into the 1930s, the United States started to become um, very more aggressive in trying to control venereal diseases. It was clear to the federal government that this was costing the government a lot of money in soldiers who weren't able to work because they were sick with gonorrhea or syphilis. So in the 1930s, the Communicable Disease Center, CDC, which later became the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was formed. And um, the battle to fight venereal disease kept picking up steam in the 30s and 40s. Um, 1944 saw the enactment of the Public Health Service Act and another major overhaul of the service began. 
The scope of work was broadened and it paved the way for other healthcare services, um, such as nurses and scientists, dietitians, physical therapists, and sanitarians. The service was only 625 officers before this act and increased to over 3,000 officers um, once it was passed. Um, these changes and many other major changes came to fruition during the tenure of another Hoosier, our seventh Surgeon General, Leonard Sheely. He was from Fort Wayne. Um, he was the first Surgeon General who really embodied the role of a national spokesperson for health. And there are even a lot of archived videos of him to this day on the internet where he's talking about vaccines and sanitation and um, public health in general. Funding for the public health service increased 14 fold during his tenure um, from 1948 to 1956, um, in part because he was a very skilled diplomat um, and he needed to be. There were controversial issues in public health um, at this time. There usually are um, in any time, but he had to deal with the initiation of fluoridization of water um, public drinking water, and um, there was an outbreak of polio after a government-sanctioned vaccination campaign, which resulted in the recall of the vaccine. Um, also during his tenure, the Transfer Act of 1955 was passed. Um, the Transfer Act moved all the duties of the Department of the Interior concerned with the maintenance and operation of hospitals and health facilities for Indians to the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, now the Department of Health and Senior Services, and the Indian Health Service was established. Sheely reported in 1955, quote, besides the obligation to develop and operate an adequate hospital and medical case system for the Indians, the service is challenged to apply the public health methods, which we know can greatly reduce Indian mortality and morbidity owing to preventable diseases. His discussion went on to talk about the recruitment of healthcare professionals in Indian country. And I, I can tell you in the 50 years after when I joined the public health service and went to work for the Indian Health Service, that recruitment had not been resolved. It was still and is still a major issue. Um, Sheely's efforts were continued with the appointment of his successor, Leroy Burney, yet another Hoosier who served as our eighth Surgeon General. And um, he attended Butler University in Indianapolis and IU. Um, prior to being the Surgeon General, he was a public health service officer who established uh, the first mobile VD clinic in the South. Um, and he also worked as Indiana's public health director while he was um, a commission officer. He was appointed by Eisenhower and he served from 1956 to 1961. And he successfully steered the public health service through a lot of institutional growing pains. Um, there was more reorganization of the structure um, to reflect its newer functions, and a lot of new things came into being during his tenure. The, uh, he created a committee to examine medical education in the United States. Um, the National Health Survey went into effect in 1957. Um, there was a radiological health report that came out in 1957. The, um, there was a environmental health problems report in 1958. Um, the National Advisory Committee on Radiation um, began in 1960. This is the height of the Cold War. Um, the National Center for Health Statistics also started in 1960 and the National Library of Medicine had its groundbreaking in 1959. This was a fulfillment of John Shaw Billings dream. Um, um, Bernie was also the first federal official to publicly identify cigarette smoke as a cause of lung cancer. This was later reported in detail by his success for Surgeon General Luther Terry. In the middle of the last century, there were some actions by the Public Health Service that are noteworthy, but quite shameful. In 1932, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment started. Um, 600 black men from Alabama were recruited. 399 of them had syphilis, 201 did not. 
Um, they were recruited to test the long-term effects of untreated syphilis. The natural course of the disease of syphilis is fatal and um, it eventually creates brain damage that is irreversible and kills people. In exchange for taking part in the participation, the um, research subjects got free medical exams, free meals, and burial insurance. They were studied for 40 years. Um, and this was long after an effective, affordable, and excessive cure was available. U.S. Public Health Service physician John Charles Cutler oversaw two other unethical studies, the Terre Haute Prison Experiments in 1943 and 44, and the Guatemala Syphilis Study of 1946 and 48. In Guatemala, prisoners, soldiers, orphans, and the mentally ill were deliberately infected with syphilis and other sexually transmitted infections through direct placement of infectious organisms and the use of infected sex workers. In the Terre Haute prison, 241 prisoners um, had various strains of gonorrhea inserted into their genitals. Each received $100, a certificate of merit, and a letter of commendation to the parole board for, um, um, at the end of the study. Let's talk a little bit about where the public health service fits into the federal government today. So there are eight uniformed services of the federal government. The Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Space Force fall under the Department of Defense, and the Coast Guard and the National um, Aeronautic and Oceanic, uh, excuse me, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Commission Corps fall under the Department of Commerce. The U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps falls under the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this yellow flag is the flag of the U.S. Public Health Service, and it's yellow because of our history with quarantines. Um, a yellow flag was used to quarantine a ship or um, a building, and hence our flag is yellow. Um, you'll notice that it has a caduceus, the two snakes intertwined um, around a staff with wings at the top. This is a symbol of the Greek god of Hermes, the patron of commerce and special protector of traveling merchants. He was also the conductor of the dead to the afterlife. The public health service in its earliest iterations was protecting port cities like Boston, Philadelphia, and New Orleans from the infections that came aboard the ships with the traded goods. It also has a fouled anchor. You'll notice the loose chain indicating a sick seaman or a dead seaman. The U.S. Army Medical Corps adopted that caduceus symbol as um, their patch in 1902, and it was probably a mistake. They were looking for a medical symbol, but they picked up our commerce symbol. Um, the rod of Aclepius that's a staff with one snake is um, a symbol of healing because the Greek god Aclepius was the god of healing. The U.S. Public Health Service um, is an officer only corps. There are 10 ranks 01 through 010, but other services like the Army also have 10 enlisted ranks E1 through 10. Um, everyone in the public health service is a college graduate um, and our official titles are terms like surgeon general director senior full senior assistant but we never actually use those titles in practice we address each other by the other sea service ranks like lieutenant lieutenant commander commander captain admiral um, lieutenant junior grade the uniforms are very similar to Navy or Coast Guard uniforms with different emblems. Within the service are different professional categories. Um, there's medicine, dentists, uh, veterinarians, nurses, therapists, pharmacists, environmental health, engineering, scientists, and then there's a catch-all category of uh, health services, a lot of the IT 
um, officers uh, serve under that category. These uniformed officers work in a variety of federal agencies. Um, this particular uniform service is relatively small compared to the others. There's only a little more than 6,000 officers in service. Um, and they have two obligations. One is to the job they hold at a federal agency, and the other is to being an officer and the responsibilities that come with that, which is mostly deploying um, as needed for public health issues. Um, some work as like scientists for the NIH or the FDA or epidemiologists for the CDC. I was a public health nurse for the Indian Health Service. Um, some fill healthcare roles in the Bureau of Prisons, the U.S. Marshal Service, um, or they're veterinarian overseeing our animal food supply. Um, and then they also deploy for hurricanes. Um, Public Health Service officers deployed for Hurricane Sandy, Gustav, Ike, Katrina, Rita, Wilma. They deployed for floods. Um, they deployed for Ebola work. They deployed at Ground Zero after 9-11, um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, Operation Enduring Freedom, um, anthrax attacks, avian flu, suicide outbreaks. Um, some serve on the USS Mercy. It's a hospital ship. To be force ready, which is um, to be prepared for deployment, is like having a part time job. There's a lot of training and then there's uniform and supplies that you have to keep up with. Um, I was on a RDF 5, Rapid Deployment Force 5, and we were on call every fifth month. Um, and it was a team of about two or 300 officers, and we could set up a hospital in about 12 hours in any place um, that could serve about 400 people for any disaster. And it was one of my very favorite parts of um, my service. I liked that long, exhausting shift. Um, I was originally a, a trauma ICU nurse, um, and I really liked that satisfying exhaustion of really meaningful work, um, that work that must be done or people will die. So how did I end up in the public health service? Um, I started my career in a burn trauma and surgical ICU at a big teaching hospital in St. Louis. And I went to a pediatric ICU also at a big teaching hospital in St. Louis. And I kind of had an epiphany after seeing a few too many kids on ventilators because of vaccine preventable illnesses like pertussis or um, a kid whose organs we were harvesting because he was riding a bike without a helmet. I really felt like you know, getting vaccines in arms or distributing helmets to underprivileged kids would um, be a better way to spend my energy. I could keep a hundred people out of the hospital for the same amount of resource as it took to keep one person alive in an ICU for 12 hours. So I shifted to public health nursing and I liked it. Um, it's a different pace and it's a different type of work. Um, this is in East St. Louis, Illinois, where I managed a lead poisoning program. That's me in the dog costume. <laughs> and um, I did a lot of health education. Um, I gave a lot of vaccines and um, I spent a lot of time in our sexually transmitted infection and in clinic. There was a lot of sex work in the community where I worked. Um, but I really enjoyed this work because I was meeting people in their community and helping them achieve wellness where they were at. So I went to graduate school and I got a master's degree in public health and um, and then I kept going to school and I was working in on a master's degree in nursing when David Satcher came to town. David Satcher was our 16th Surgeon General and the 11th Assistant Secretary for Health. And he spoke about health disparities and closing that gap. And it really struck me. And I looked into the public health service and decided that this is something that I wanted to pursue. So I sold my house in St. Louis and packed up my toddler and I got a job with the Indian Health Service 
took a long time while I waited for my Senate confirmation of my commission. Um, and then I packed up and moved across the country to the Southwest to begin working at Fort Defiance Indian Hospital in Fort Defiance, Arizona. The motto of the public health service is to promote, or excuse me, to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of the nation. And this was a motto that I could really get behind. It was in line with my values and a mission that I really wanted to be part of. I was proud of it then, and I'm still really proud of that service today. So for those who don't know, um, the Navajo Nation is in the southwest part of the United States in the Four Corners region. Um, it spans three states. It is 29,000 square miles. It's the size of West Virginia. And um, I was stationed um, right on the New Mexico-Arizona border, kind of in the heart of the Navajo Nation, near the Navajo Nation capital of Window Rock. And what was it like when I got there? Well, it was muddy. Um, it's a high elevation, about 6,700 feet, and it had snowed a lot that winter. And when I arrived, it was muddy, really, really muddy. I had this new uniform that I was still figuring out how to fuss with. You know, it had shirt stays and iron shirt and an iron shirt and shiny shoes and um, pins and epaulets, and there was just a lot to it. You had to keep your head covered when you're outside, and man the mud i was just overwhelmed with the mud because there are not that many paved roads and there are not that many graded roads and most of them are just dirt and this is what happens to dirt when it rains a lot i was also really short of breath because i had not lived at that high of an elevation and i didn't have enough red blood cells to carry all the oxygen i needed for the work i was doing so it took me about three months before um, my body made enough red blood cells to increase my oxygen carrying capacity so what was it like for me out there um the language um Dene Fasad is the name of the language it was really really hard for me um when I arrived there were about 150,000 Navajo speakers and um, I was really challenged to understand Navajo and to pick it up I eventually took a class at the community college um but I did not do very well in the class and I frankly I was glad when I got deployed for a hurricane so that I could drop the class because I was the only person who wasn't getting it everyone else in there was already a Navajo speaker they were taking it for an easy A um, but I kept trying and I tried for years and some of it sunk in and some of it didn't um, I could barely introduce myself in Navajo which is an important um formal so social norm to introduce yourself um but um i did pick up some terms i learned the clans of my friends when people introduce themselves they identify their four clans the one they get one from each of their grandparents um like one of my friends was Skizhni and Torkonsha and tachini and kiani um i drove a lot of miles um, on any given day, I could drive between two and 400 miles visiting folks and um, doing public health work at different um, agencies. When I first arrived, coming from very green Missouri, um, spending my summers in the woods and on the rivers of Missouri, I didn't appreciate the desert beauty, but um, it grew on me very quickly, and um, I soon realized that this is a spectacular place of natural beauty. Um, this is Monument Valley, uh, a, a Navajo Nation park and ship rock, um, Window Rock, which is where the Navajo Nation capital is. And then that is a view from the top of the Chuska Mountains. I lived um, at the base of the Chuska Mountains and spent a lot of time in the Chuska Mountains and it became one of my favorite places on the whole planet. Um, I love the Southwest so much that my original two-year assignment stretched out into five years and then I stayed in the Southwest for another 10 years beyond that. Um, lots of Dene people are sheep herders. Um, so there are sheeps everywhere. Sheep 
Um, my family had chickens and pigs and cows. They're agrarian, but I had never been around sheep, so that was new. Um, I didn't really like mutton when I first arrived, but roasted mutton became an acquired taste, and um, I still crave it sometimes, although it's hard to find. Um, something else that struck me um, was a lot of my families made health decisions as a group, as and I was used to people making very individual health decisions. It was health decisions were always a private matter for people in the Midwest um, and in these communities. Families would gather, discuss the matter, make a decision collectively, um, and then they would all support and get behind that decision too. So there was always a good support system for whatever health ills were facing a particular individual or a family. Probably half of my workload was visiting senior citizens. Um, in Navajo land, it's appropriate to address older um, grandmas as um, my mother or my, my grandmother, Shema, Shema Sani. Um, and it's a very matriarchal society. So it was interesting that to me that um, women were the owners of the home and they passed their homes down to their daughters. When men marry into the family, they go to where the woman lives um, because it's her home. My Diné friends would often refer to their parents' home as their mother's home only. Um, they didn't say their parents' home because it didn't belong to their father, it only belonged to their mother. So, So I visited lots of babies um, and I learned a lot about how babies are cared for in Navajo culture. Um, it's often the maternal grandmother that's in charge of what's going on with the baby. Um, babies are often kept in cradle boards, which is a really great way to keep a baby feeling safe and to keep them safe because you know, if they roll over in a cradle board, um, that wooden arch protects their head and they're very snug and they're easy to move around to in a cradle board. Um, the Navajo word for cradle board is a weights all. Um, they use cedar wood for boys and pinyon wood for girls. Um, I also learned about the first laugh ceremony, which is a really wonderful way to celebrate the life of a child. When a baby laughs for the first time, around four months or so, um, the person who makes that baby laugh is responsible for teaching that child about generosity. And they have to throw a big party um, and everybody's invited. Um, I made a baby laugh and I had to make stew for like 75 people. And then me and that baby gave all the guests salt, um, Zuni salt, and a little goodie bag. Um, and it was, an incredibly special thing for me to be included in. Um, I will always cherish that. Dene people um, live in a variety of homes, um, some mobile homes, some frame houses, lots of hogans. Um, the one thing they all have in common is that Navajo homes always face east, which is their principal cardinal direction. So the maps I grew up with always had north at the top, but um, I think um, a Navajo elder drawing a compass would probably put east at the top. East is the first direction that people see when they open their door in the morning to greet the sun and to start their day with prayers and blessings. Traditional Dene dress is an elaborate affair. Um, Older women wear floral headscarves and turquoise and red coral necklaces and collar pins and squash blossom pins and necklaces and hair buns and earrings and velvet skirts and the men will wear ribbon shirts and cowboy hats. Um, and um, there are traditional hair buns as well that um, you see on both men and women and are very common. Um, Additionally, a lot of people will have a toradin pouch. Toradin is um, corn pollen, and this is um, used for saying prayers and um, giving blessings. Um, so that's a, attached as part of the um, traditional wear. I 
sometimes would find myself wanting to complain about my uniform in this environment because it wasn't always practical but honestly these grandmas who were herding their sheep had a more elaborate ensemble than i did going to visit them there's not a lot of infrastructure on the Navajo Nation, so many people have to haul water. There's not a lot of surface water. Um, there are not pipes. There's not very many paved roads. There's not even electricity in every community. Um, and it gives new meaning to the word food desert because some people are 50, even 70 miles from a banana. Um, and good nutrition can be a big challenge if there's not electricity for refrigeration. Since my focus was always on health, I wanted to mention two things that really interfere with um, Dene people being healthy. And the first is historical or multi-generational trauma. Um, multi-generational trauma is experienced by a specific culture, racial, or ethnic group. It's related to major events that oppress a particular group of people because of their status as oppressed. Um, that's the definition from Sotero in 2006. Um, Kit Carson's forced relocation of Dene people to Bosque Rodondo and his scorched earth policy where farms and orchards and homes were just wiped away. And then the systematic oppression by the US government and prejudice by Western settlers and the ongoing pervasive and overt racism and prejudice is substantially impacting the health of Dene people to this day. And I, I can't talk about the health of this people without bringing this up. The second impediment to good health is this legacy of uranium mining. Um, uranium and vanadium have been mined on the Navajo Nation since 1941. And these abandoned mines, all the red dots in the upper left hand corner of your screen, um, contaminate the communities that they're in and they contaminate the surrounding areas. Plus, a lot of the people hired to work these mines were Navajo people who were contaminated with radioactive material. Um, so they have these unusual cancers and high cancer rates as a legacy to the um, Cold War. Dene culture is really rich with art and masterful artisans. Um, basket makers, potters, moccasin makers, and weavers. I've been collecting indigenous art my entire adult life. And my very favorite media um, are uh, Dene or Navajo woven, woven rugs. Um, I'm really honored to have been able to watch this entire process because um, there are months, even years, that grow into making um, a rug from what comes out of the land. Um, first, these weavers have to herd sheep and shear them, then they cart the wool by hand, they spin the wool by hand, and they dye the wool with the things that grow out of the ground, and then they have to build a loom and create the weaving tools, um, and then they weave a picture into a giant rug that can take months to finish, and the image only exists in their brain. Um, and it is absolutely amazing. There is a, uh, an underappreciated genius in these works of art that I really cherish. Um, so I, I wanted to share a few stories and a few other observations. Um, first, I want to tell you how Navajo people were always very, very welcoming to me. I was an outsider, a white guy in a federal uniform who didn't know anything about anybody. Um, but I was always made to feel as a welcome guest. Um, another thing I learned is that rodeo is a very big deal. In fact, the entire Navajo Nation government, I think, adjusts its schedule around the Professional Bull Riders Association schedule. Um, Early in the morning is the best time to experience the reservation. Um, it's beautiful and it's when you can see pronghorns and, um, and wild pronghorn herds are really 
um, incredible. Um, also, it's when people are getting up and greeting the sun and saying their morning prayers, and it's just a beautiful time. Um, also, Navajo people are resilient and resourceful and interesting deep thinkers. Um, they have a respect for nature for what it is and live in harmony with the land as opposed to trying to have mastery over it. Um, I came from people that really wanted the land to serve them. Um, so it was a very interesting juxtaposition to live amongst people who wanted to live in harmony with the land instead. So I want to tell you a few stories. And the first is um, from the community of Nat Azil. That means strong planning. Um, this particular chapter um, was the last one added to the Navajo Nation because it was added after some Navajo people were forcibly relocated in the 1980s after what was called the Navajo Hopi land dispute. Um, that dispute might actually have more to do with a coal mine than um, Navajos and Hopis not getting along. They have lived peacefully next to each other for many, many, many generations. So this is um, a a Navajo weaver and she um, has diabetes and I see her on a really regular basis. I fill up her pill boxes. Um, she's Navajo only speaking so one has a sun for her morning meds and one has a moon for her evening meds and she always looks at the floor when we're talking. She never looks me in the face, never. And um, because we have a language barrier, um, I, I need to check her sugar, I need to do some things and um, I just assume that she tolerates me and doesn't really like me um, because we never have eye contact and um, she always greets me politely, but you know, there's not much beyond that. So she goes to the hospital and she's there for a while and when she gets out, I go to see her and she practically runs out of her house. She's a very frail old woman. And she gives me a big hug and she shakes my hand and she she calls me Shayaja. That means my little one. That's a term of endearment that you use for your children or your grandchildren. I was really taken aback by that. I didn't understand. So um, I, I call her daughter and I, I say, you know, this is how she's doing. Her daughter happens to be a public health nurse in another community. And she goes, oh, she missed you so much. You know, she's, she, she couldn't stand being in the hospital. She wanted to be at home. She wanted you to take care of her. And I was really taken aback by this. I said, I, you know, I thought your mom didn't like me. And um, I explained about the eye contact. And she said, you know, a lot of traditional Navajo um, people are taught not to make eye contact because it's um, considered aggressive um, and it's not polite. So she was just being nice and the nonverbals that she was taught. I had misread an entire relationship that lasted over a year um, because we were enculturated with different nonverbals, but it really touched me when that woman called me Shiyaja. She called me Shiyaja every day after that. I, I saw her too. It was very nice. The next guy I want to tell you about is Pete. That's not his real name. Um, he lived in a community called Wide Ruins. He lived in a trailer in a very remote area. There was no electricity, no paved roads, no graded roads. Um, it was kind of hard to get to. Um, no running water. Um, I saw him because he suffered from depression. And one time while I was visiting him, um, I look in his ear and he has a hole in his eardrum. And I said, how'd you get a hole in your eardrum? And he proceeds to tell me how his father died. And then his mother had to work off the reservation and his auntie was responsible for him when he was a little boy. And she had a lot of responsibilities and she didn't do a good job watching him. And one time he touched a dead owl and Another time you went to play in a cemetery. Those are taboo things that um, traditional Navajos are not supposed to do. And he was saving up for a ceremony. He needed to see a medicine man. It took him 20 minutes to get all of this out. And um, he gave me a lot of other details and I didn't get an answer to my question. Anyway, I came back um, again to see him a couple weeks later and I asked again about the eardrum and I got a longer version with all the same elements, the owl, the cemetery, the um, dead father, the working mother, the busy aunts, etc, etc, but still I didn't get an answer. Um, 
So I, I, I come back on a third visit and I'm, I'm kind of impatient. I really want to know the answer to this question. How did you get a hole in your eardrum? Did you have an infection? Did you fall? Whatever. So he tells me the whole thing again and it's more, it's got more details this time. And he's really fixated on, he's trying to save up for this ceremony. And I just don't understand why I can't get him to answer this one question. He and I have a good rapport and he just won't. And then I keep pressing and I press and finally he tells me, well, I fell off a ladder. And I said, well, what did that other stuff have to do with this? And he explained that he believed because of the owl in the cemetery and he was out of harmony with nature and that he needed the ceremony to reestablish that harmony. Now, again, what does this have to do with this ear? He believes that nature um, might have caused that injury to his ear because he's still out of harmony and he might be at risk for more ear problems because he doesn't have this balance back in his life. So he needs the ceremony to reestablish that. So everything he was telling me was germane and absolutely pertinent to what he wanted to tell me. Um, but he had this circular way of thinking about it um, that was much more broad and encompassing than my very linear and direct way of asking about it. And so that was my awakening about circular versus linear thought and how different people can conceptualize health and um, everything that feeds into that concept of health. The last story I want to share with you is uh, about another older woman and um, she had been pushed down. She had a, a nasty fall. It was a goat. And um, I found her on a very muddy, muddy day and she's herding her sheep with her daughter. And I say, I, I want to check you out. I, I heard that you had a fall. People contacted me. And so I came out to make sure that your head is okay, to make sure that you're okay. And she says, all right, but I, I got to get my sheep and my goats in the corral. She's using her daughter to translate for me and um, she wants my help. So I am putting these very stinky sheep and these extremely stinky goats into the corral and it takes quite a while and I get very muddy and very stinky in the process. Um, but I get them all in and then I go back down the hill to where she's at and she says, okay, now you can come back. So she wasn't going to let me check on her that day. She was going to let me come back to see her. So she must have been OK for another visit. And I go back to the office and I'm telling my Diné colleagues about this. And they all just started laughing because they knew that she was just making me the butt of a future joke of hers. And I hope to this day she is still telling the very funny story of how she got the Belladonna officer to corral all her sheep while she watched and laughed. Um, I'd like to leave you with the blessing that was often bestowed upon me, and that is to walk in beauty. And if you have any questions, please ask. I'm muted, sorry. Thank you so much, Demetrius. That was fabulous. Are you still with us and, and available for some Q&A? I am. Um, you have to <laughs> video though. Oh, let me try to fix that. We don't have any questions in the Q&A right now, but uh, for the audience, now is a great time to, to post your questions there. Oh, there you are. Okay. I thought I was doing something wrong. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed the history part of your talk, but I think what I found even more rewarding was hearing about your experience with the Indian Health Service. Um, I thought that was fabulous. And I, I suspect that, oh, we have a, a question, hang on. 
So Sue asks, are there any studies comparing early PHS employee morale to current morale? That's an interesting question. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. And I, I look in the literature quite a bit about um, public health workforces. Um, I, um, I, I can tell you anecdotally that um, the morale of officers was pretty high, much more so than the morale of Indian Health Service um, employees, which most of whom are civilians. Um, but the Public Health Service, uh, that group is a little different. They're, they have extra motivation. They're, they're much more competitive. Um, uh, and they're, they have a deep commitment to their work and their, their practice. Um, they'll go anywhere and do any job they're told to do in the name of that mission. So. I have a question that is kind of um, kind of related to that difference, I guess. I, I'm wondering if you, you and I have talked about this before and, and about whether, you know, some of some of the folks that you went out to visit um, were maybe a little suspicious <laughs> of you or your intentions or or um you know, if, if there was strain or tension in that relationship. But now I'm also wondering if there was a difference between your experience and the experience of the, the civilians um, kind of on yeah. the other side. Yeah, and I have, I have a story related to that. So um, I, was, um, I, I was at a meeting with um, a bunch of other public health nurses from the reservation. Um, it's mostly women, in fact, they were all women except for me. And I would say half of them were Diné people and half of them were um, non-Native people. And maybe a third of us were commissioned officers and the rest were civilians. And we were talking about the different challenges that we had um, gaining entree. Gaining entree is a term that we use for establishing trust in a home or in a community. And I said that my biggest challenge was around... Um, new parents. Um, you know, I was going, I did a lot of mother baby visits. I had a lot of referrals for well babies. And um, I often found that new moms and the maternal grandmother of that baby did not want to hear anything I had to say about how to care for a child. Um, they were not accustomed to getting parenting advice from a man. Um, especially a white man and a white man who works for the federal government. And this was an ongoing challenge for me, but um, I had really good rapport with elders and my diabetic patients and my, my colleagues and I were sitting around at this public health nurse gathering. And um, one of my colleagues who was also a commissioned officer, um, but she is uh, a Dene person. She said, it's, the new moms are never going to trust you because you're a man. Um, and I can't get my diabetic patients to do anything I say. Um, so she felt like she had a barrier being Navajo trying to advise people about um, diabetes and nutrition and, oh. um, but had really good rapport with her new moms. So, you know, when you're a nurse, especially when you're a community health nurse and you're out in the community, you, you really only have yourself as the instrument. And I think, you know, what you bring um, fits some situations better than others. So um, I, I did have those challenges. I um, also knew other nurses who worked for the Indian Health Service with different tribes. And in some other communities, um, they felt like it was a much more hostile relationship. I did not feel that working in Navajo land, that it was ever hostile toward me. Um, but I know other public health nurses that left jobs in other parts of the country working with other tribes um, because there was still so much um, resentment and tension between the tribe and the federal government that as an agent of the federal government, they didn't feel welcome and they they didn't always feel safe in the communities that they were serving. Thank you. Um, Karen would like to ask, how did the health service participate in the COVID pandemic? Were they involved with vaccination programs or other areas of patient care? 
They did. So I only know this because I was watching from afar. Um, during the pandemic, I was the public health director for a county of about 400,000 people in suburban St. Louis. This was in Missouri. And, um, but I still have lots of Navajo friends. One of my children is Navajo and lives on the reservation. And um, so I, I knew what was happening there. And um, it was a pretty phenomenal response, honestly. When I was um, in Navajo land, when we would have flu clinics, it was amazing to me how many people would come out and roll up their sleeves to get a flu vaccine. Um, it's a really remote area, but we would have these clinics and sometimes 800, 1200 people would show up um, and they would drive really far for this. So I, I wasn't completely surprised that when COVID came, the community really rallied together and they did a good job of social distancing and um, vaccinating folks. Um, their vaccination rate was incredibly high and very, very quick. Um, they had a good response. The current director of the Navajo Nation Department of Health, Dr. Jill Jim, um, is pretty resourceful as well. So it wasn't just the Indian Health Service, it was the tribe itself. Um, they, they just rallied around this issue and I think they managed it pretty good. Uh, are things, um, and it's in parentheses, health and access, um, where you work generally much better, worse, or staying the same? Also, are more local people going into healthcare? That's a great question. Um, there are a lot of um, native people in the United States going into healthcare to continue to be of service to their community. While I was in the public health service, so that was from 2005 until 2009, um, the number of native nurses surpassed the number of non-native nurses. So that was, you know, um, quite a while ago, but within the Indian Health Service, there were more native than non-native nurses that that occurred, that threshold was passed while I was there. Um, access is, so you have to think of access in two ways. One, um, just logistics and structure. Um, are there buildings and, you know, are, are there the appropriate types of clinics and hospitals? And some is better than other. Um, there are seven or eight hospitals in Navajo land that are run by the Indian Health Service or run by the tribe and funded in part by the Indian Health Service. Um, and then there's some private um, healthcare industry, but not very much. But even if you have those facilities, you don't always have the staff to staff them. These are remote areas, it's hard to recruit staff. Um, and then there's another piece of access that I think is really important. And, and that's whether or not people feel welcome in their own facilities. Um, I observed a lot of prejudice and microaggressions directed towards Native people when they were seeking care from the Indian Health Service, which exists to provide them health care. Um, but not everybody that goes to work for the Indian Health Service um, is in it because they have empathy and a deep compassion for, for providing good service. They have other motivations. Um, frankly, they couldn't cut it in the private sector and the Indian Health Service was desperate, so they picked them up. Um, there are some providers who go there with a the missionary mentality. They're, they're, they're really there to proselytize for their faith um, and their medical obligation or mission is secondary to that. So um, that creates an unwelcoming environment. You know, um, I, I saw a lot of patients who were shamed for traditional practices. Um, if they were having a ceremony or, or they would be dismissed for their concerns about medication um, and they would be judged just because they had some um, well-earned mistrust of anything the federal government offered them. So I, I think that there are some barriers. Um, I also think that there are some access issues that aren't apparent on the surface. Um, the, the big thing that you can really categorize um, as a barrier though, is just the rurality. This is frontier rule. It, it's, it's even beyond like rural Indiana or rural Midwest. Um, you can have one or two people per square mile in some parts of um, the reservation. So it's very remote. People have to drive a really long distance 
um, for even the most minor healthcare thing. Karen has another question. Uh, she said, you spoke about the programs and historical influences of the health service through about the 1960s. Other than the Indian health services, where are the priorities of the health service since that time? I think they're always evolving. And I also think that um, it has to do a lot with what the health mission of the administration is. Um, since the, the, all, all commissioned officers serve at the pleasure of the president, um, what is done with that arm of the government really has a lot to do with what the mission of that administration is. Um, I, I mentioned Vivek Murthy's um, current agenda because the administration is behind that agenda. So he's really concerned about health misinformation, um, COVID-19, um, healthcare worker burnout, um, and mental health. And I, I think those are really great issues to be concerned about in the nation from a public health lens. Um, but, you know, when we have another presidential election, that agenda will change. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me when we have a Congress um, that is um, a little less split down party lines, um, if we start seeing some legislation that um, reflects our nation's views about public health interventions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, I think we could be um, getting ready for some no, some more overhauls around our public health infrastructure. Um, I mean, this pandemic really shook us all to the core and we learned some things about what should change um, and whichever party gains control of Congress and the administration going forward, um, we'll see that type of legislation acted. Uh, I have a follow-up question that's related to some of the issues you mentioned um, surrounding, uh, you know, lack of empathy and understanding and cultural competency. I'm wondering, are there things that the Indian Health Service is doing to address some of those problems within its own ranks, so to speak? Uh, or are there things that you think that they could be doing to, to improve that? I think the Indian Health Service does a really good job addressing that. Um, but, you know, the Indian Health Service as an agency um, is at the mercy of the people willing to work in Indian country. And that is some of the most inhospitable land in the United States. It's the most economically depressed land in the United States. So getting healthcare professionals to go work in these remote hospitals and live on reservations is a challenge. So they have this uphill battle of teaching outsiders. This is what our experience is. This is the prejudice we endure and please don't bring it with you when you come. Um, and thanks for being here, um, providing care. And I, I think that the Indian Health Service really works hard at this. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that while I was in um, the public health service that their recruitment efforts to have native nurses finally surpassed the midway point. That is the type of effort that they're putting in. It's a big deal to have somebody go hundreds or even thousands of miles away from their home um, when they're in a culture where everybody is interdependent and they always work together for their entire family to go away to study for years and come back with their professional degree to provide services to that community. Um, but they've done it over and over and over again to the point that there are a lot of native nurses now um, who understand a lot of that cultural nuance and you know, cultural fluency is not something that they have to work on. So I do think that the Indian Health Service works hard on this and it's an ongoing effort, um, but they're still mostly dealing with people who are outsiders to their community. So trying to get them to understand that even if they don't come from a place where they ever felt obligated to learn about another culture or to be sensitive to it um, is a challenge. Thank you. 
Looks like that's all that we had in the Q and A. Um, I'll declare a uh, last call on the questions. <laughs> Give everyone just a moment. Um, Like that's it. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful talk. I really appreciate you sharing your time and your experiences with us. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. <laughs> I hope you all have a, a great day. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and we will see you again soon at the next event, which we hope will be in person again at the museum.